Hello podcasters, welcome to Living History and welcome back. We've been off the air for a few weeks while I was travelling around Europe and it's wonderful to be back here with you now presenting a whole new series of fantastic podcasts. I hope you had a very special Anzac Day. It was a pretty important one this year, the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Villers Bretno on the Western Front and I was super lucky to be there at Villers Bretno for the centenary. I hope some of you were there as well because it was a really special event, a really wonderful Anzac Day. There was about 8,000 people who turned up at Villers Bretno for Anzac Day. Absolutely remarkable. And a wonderful commemoration. A lot of people there. The whole Somme region had really turned into a little piece of Australia. There were Aussie flags, kangaroo signs, all sorts of stuff going on to commemorate Australia. And just a really special Anzac Day. And while I was in Europe, I got the chance to go to Germany. I went to Holland. I went to the UK. I spent a lot of time in France. Saw some fantastic historic sites. Spoke to some wonderful historians. And I'm going to bring you those on podcasts coming up in the coming weeks and months. So so tune in for those. We've got some really great stuff and history that we, we can't access very readily from Australia. So I'm really enjoying bringing these wonderful history stories to you, particularly from Europe. Today's episode, a really special one to kick off with to welcome us back onto the, uh, onto the podcast channel. We've got Sir Tony Robinson Baldrick from Blackadder, as you know him. Um, just a really great bloke, and he's become one of the most popular history presenters on TV right around the world. He's done some wonderful things. I was fortunate enough a few years ago to make a history program with him, which was Tony Robinson's World War I, and he's just such a lovely bloke. He knows his history inside and out. He's a wonderful TV presenter, and he's a much-loved figure. And so I was delighted to catch up with Tony and have a chat with him about what he's been doing lately, some of the TV work he's been doing, and the influence history has had on his career and his life as a whole. It was really wonderful to catch up with him. Thank you for joining me. Let's jump straight into it. Here's Sir Tony Robinson. A date which will live in infamy. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist attack. This was their final tower. Tony, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on Living History. Not at all. Good to speak to you again. You've done some incredible work in the history space, and I think if my listeners were sitting here with me and had the opportunity to talk to you about it, they'd be, I think they'd be intrigued to know how you made this transition from beloved actor to this one of Britain's most popular history presenters. So, so how did that occur? Was history something you always loved? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, although I didn't know it was called history when I was a little boy, I think it came from my dad and my mum talking to me from the time I was a baby about their adventures during World War II. I was born in 1946, so it it was really fresh in their minds. And from a very early age, it wasn't like either of them had what they call a great war. You know, they didn't win medals or anything. My mum was was in the Women's uh, Air Force, and she was working in Reading uh, as a typist. In fact, she seems to me to have spent the whole war defending Britain from Hitler by doing amateur dramatics, <laughs> all the photos that I see of her in little church halls from that time are of her performing in plays. And and, and my dad was uh, a corporal fitter in the uh, RAF up in uh, eastern Scotland. And uh, they were both working class kids. The war was the first time they'd been away for any extended period of time they were meeting people the like of whom they'd never met before um, and had all these little adventures and so when they talked to me about them I I just understood that there was a time that wasn't my time there was a time before my time when my mum and dad had been young and had adventures and by extension there must have been a time when their mum and dad were young and had adventures and backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards I really had no idea it was called history until I was about 10 when I was told that you could get marks in it which seemed to be pretty silly because you'd want to know that stuff anyway wouldn't you well that's how I felt anyway so I've always been like that to me history is as central to my life as Breathing, walking, running about, getting upset, all those things. I can certainly understand that. I'm much the same myself. Um, your most famous character, uh, Baldrick, on Blackadder. I mean, Blackadder was a wonderful program, but I think 
the structure of it in these historic settings was was quite unique for a comedy program. Do you think that had an influence on 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 your interest in history, on 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 the way you saw history? Well, I didn't start doing Blackadder until I was about 38. So I was actually in my mid-40s most of the time it was on. So I'm not sure that Blackadder influenced me, although I like to think that I had some influence on Blackadder. It was a very collective and cooperative way of working. And all of the people in it, uh, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Ben Elton, uh, Richard Curtis, Rowan, uh, John Lloyd, the producer. We we were all, we all shared this passion for history, and uh, in fact, it was Ben Elton who who was the great World War One nut who persuaded us to do that fourth series almost single handedly because he was so passionate about first, the First World War. Well, that must have been a very bold decision at the time as well to take something uh, you know as as revered as the First World War and to make a comedy program about it. Was that a, was that a bit of a gamble? Did you think? It was something we discussed at enormous length. We were terribly confident young men at that time. Um, And I don't think we felt that we would fail. What we wanted to make sure was that nobody thought we were taking the mickey out of the people who died. What What we were taking the mickey out of was the madness that led to them sacrificing their lives rather than the fact that they died. Um... And I think we did that fairly successfully. And, and the, the very final episode, when we go over the top, was very much a mission statement on our part. We wanted the audience to understand exactly uh, what it was that we were talking about. I think you succeeded greatly. It was a, a wonderful moment in TV, that, uh, that final scene in that final episode. I think it shocked a lot of people and um, was just a, just a wonderful way to finish the series. Moving on from that, you you then did Time Team for many, many years. I I have to ask, every time I watch Time Team, I'm always astounded by the incredible wealth of history that lies just beneath the soil in Britain and Europe. Was it like that for you? Were you, every time a a Roman villa or an Anglo-Saxon village was exposed, were you astounded and delighted? Or does it become a little bit pedestrian after a while, just one discovery after another? No, uh, if you could imagine, I... uh, even during the high season of Time Team, we seldom did more than one every two or three weeks. So it was always an, ad- an adventure with your mates. And sometimes the adventure might end with you not finding much, or indeed in one episode we didn't find anything at all, or it might end with you discovering a Roman villa. Um, but it was very much a, a, a collaborative exercise, all of us focused on this one thing and, and having a good old piss up in the evenings. It was... Uh, yeah, I, I really, that was a really formative part of my life. And, and it's still very much with me. Um, today, uh, I'm uh, doing a series during which uh, I'm mudlarking. I don't know how familiar your listeners will be with that expression, but it's, it was what the kids and the very poor used to do on the, uh, the foreshores of the River Thames in the 18th and 19th century, poking around in what originally would have been poo until the sewers went in when it became mud and sand, looking for the things that had been washed, uh, washed up, dropped, or whatever. And uh, even today, the foreshores of the Thames are absolutely jammed full of old bits and pieces of bric-a-brac, which have been dropped over the last few centuries. And uh, in my pocket now, I've got a, um, a broken piece of clay pipe, uh, which I know it's uh, round about the 1860s, 70s, 80s, for two reasons. First of all, because that's when the guys started stamping on the side of the pipes that they were the manufacturers of them. But on the other side of this pipe, other words, it took me about... Uh, about five minutes before I could decipher them, uh, C.S. Purnell, MP, uh, I'd found a pipe um, celebrating the life of Charles Stuart uh, Barnell, uh, the great Irish nationalist MP. Uh, a, a bit of history just came up out of the Thames, roaring to life. It's just wonderful stuff. I get I get chills when I when I hear about this, and I find that when I'm in Europe, just being exposed to the history. It's probably something in Australia we don't have the opportunity to do as much, being a relatively uh, new country. And I think um, the series you've just completed working on about the cathedrals, I think that sums it up really well, these these wonderful ancient buildings that that really litter the landscape around Britain. Tell us about that series and, and, and what an adventure it was discovering those cathedrals. 
they are extraordinary. They're like colossal dinosaurs in the in the British landscape, uh, built by superb engineers, mostly from a few years after the Norman Conquest through to the 14th and early 15th century, uh, continually added on to. But because they are so beautiful, because they've been so important as far as religion is concerned, people have always wanted to invest in them. And it means that they're still there to this this very day. Um, we did six cathedrals, uh, Canterbury, which everyone will have heard of, York, which is the great cathedral of the north, uh, Durham, uh, where many of the early saints were buried, Winchester, which was the old capital of uh, Saxon England before London became the capital, Salisbury, which has the, until, believe it or not, until the 1960s, Salisbury Cathedral, built in the 13th century, was the tallest building in England. Really? I didn't Uh, know that. Yeah, until the post office tower, which people who've been to London may have noticed, and the uh, the western side of the big city. Until then, yeah, it was tall. And, and inside, you can see um, medieval carpentry. It's like scaffolding. But what it is, is you can't hold a spire taut uh, because when it's windy, the spire is going to move. And if it's just solid, it's going to crack. So you've got to let it move in the wind, even though it's made of uh, of stone, the mortar between the stones has got to be allowed to move. But, of course, over the centuries, it, it's, uh, uh, it is going to crack. And so inside it, there was a whole network of wood, like a jigsaw puzzle of wood, which barely touched the sides. So it would still allow the spire to sway backwards and forwards and just be nudged back into position by this medieval carpentry. And it's still there to this very day, built, I don't know, 700, more than 700 years ago. It's just incredible stuff, and I think that's why people enjoy watching your programs, to, to, to learn these, these aspects of these buildings and of history that we, we don't understand. And I, I find that whenever I've visited these great cathedrals in the UK, each of them has their own personality. Each one feels like it can tell a different story. Did you have a favourite of all the cathedrals you visited? I think one of the ones that I liked, which I didn't expect to, was Liverpool Cathedral. Uh, which wasn't started until uh, the uh, just after the First World War, I think it was, and uh, wasn't finished till the 1960s. Uh, and but it's built. It's a modern spin or a 20th century spin on the uh, on the Gothic style of the original cathedrals. And all the other cathedrals have had bits added onto them over the centuries and over the decades a bit like a you know like an old hospital that was built in victorian times ha- has various wings added to it and little offshoots in order to cope with the new demands that are made on it that's mostly what our cathedrals are like but to see liverpool cathedral in in its pristine state so huge so clean its line so magnificent and with a with uh, with an organ that at the time when it was put in in the in the early 20th century, one of the the biggest and most magnificent of its kind, many of the pipes are actually in the walls of the cathedral. So when you play it, it's like the cathedral itself is reverberating and playing the music. It's astonishing, doesn't it? It sounds wonderful. I look forward to to seeing the series. In terms of history in general, we live in some fairly interesting times at the moment. Do you, do you think personally that history is still important in the 21st century? Are there lessons that we should be learning from history that we're not taking on board? Um, I think most people would agree that, that, that that's pretty much a given. I, I, th- I find it a bit sad that um, some kids aren't interested in history uh and i know sometimes that's down to the teaching uh and i say that as someone who will defend our teachers to uh, to my last breath i think teaching is is the most honorable and wonderful profession but of course like any other industry there's going to be a few people in it who aren't very good at, it at all and i know some kids get alienated from history and, and are so for the rest of their lives but uh, i think for most of us 
having a sense of history gives us perspective. And for me, context is all. Context is the way that you understand anything. And uh, the, you know, all the things that happen today, if you don't understand about the context, you're not really going to get it. Like, it was in the early 1920s that a Frenchman called uh, Pico and an Englishman called Sykes uh, actually created the map which divided up the Middle East. And if you look at a map of the Middle East, you'll find an awful lot of straight lines. And that's not because that's where one tribe ended and another tribe began or one mountain range or river ended and began. It's because that's where Sykes and Pico uh, drew the lines with their rulers. Uh, and it's little wonder, I think, that today there is so much enmity against both America uh, and uh, uh, Britain and, and France because we created the mess in the first place. It was one of the, uh, the the final gestures of colonial power. We really destroyed the, the the chance of so many of the countries in the Middle East developing organically over the next half century because we'd already dictated where those boundaries should be. And if you don't get that, of course you're not going to understand. Why are these people getting so uppity? Why us? Why are they looking back at us? What did we do wrong? It's very well said. Um, th thank you so much for your time, Tony. It's been really wonderful. Just before we let you go, you've been to Australia a few times and made some interesting programs out here. Uh, any plans to come back and do some more work in Australia? Um, well, that's really down to television companies. Uh, for four years, I was invited uh, uh, by History Channel to come out and see you and the one year ABC. No one has made that invite recently ironically i'm now in what i'm actually sitting it's a lovely late spring day uh, in britain at the moment and i'm seated in what's called the uh, the chelsea uh, physic garden and it's full of all the old plants and trees from years and centuries gone by and it was started with the collection that was brought back by captain cook and joseph banks so uh, even though i'm not with you and have been invited back recently. Uh, looking out at this fantastic garden, my heart is with you. Well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to do what we can to remedy that and get you back out uh, out here as soon as possible. Tony, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are, and it's uh, it's wonderful to hear from you and all the wonderful things you're doing in history. And uh, hopefully, we can uh, talk to you again soon. That would be nice.